the Lord, there's forgiveness with the Lord for saying such a thing. <laughs> Psalm 116, please. Come with me to Psalm 116. We're back in the Egyptian Hallel again. We have two Psalms left to, to deal with. I've just enjoyed this immensely, uh, and I hope you have too. We're going to get halfway through Psalm 16 tonight, 116. And we're left with the longest one of all, Psalm 118. What surprises we'll have there. If each of these Psalms you think about the Lord and the apostles singing them, because that was the custom that the Egyptian Hallel would be sung on Passover. So they would sing 114 and 115 before they ate the Passover, and 116, 117, and 118, or some of them after they ate the Passover. So our Lord and his 12 would actually have sung these the night before he was uh, arrested, the night of his arrest. So that makes it really significant and special when we go through all of this. So we're going to get halfway, Lord willing, tonight. And so uh, I'm going to read the whole psalm, though, because there's, there's parts of it in the second part really connect very much to the first part, and we'll realize we're not even close to summing this up and applying it. I love the Lord, because he's heard my voice and my supplications. Because he has hath inclined his ear to me, therefore will I call on him as long as I live. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of Sheol got hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord, and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. I think uh, NIV says simple-minded or something like that. Simple. What is it? Simple-hearted. Simple That's a little better than simple-minded, isn't it? The Lord uh, preserves the simple-hearted or the simple. I was brought low, and he helped me. Return to thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. One of my favorite verses in this psalm. I noticed that uh, when I was young, and it was a real blessing to me. I'll walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believe, therefore, I've spoken. I was great, but we're going to stop at verse 9 tonight. I believe, therefore, I've spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? I'll take the cup of salvation. I'll call in the name of the Lord. I'll pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly, I am you, thy servant. I am thy servant and son of thy handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. I'll offer to thee sacrifice of thanksgiving, I'll call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord, now in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of the O Jerusalem, praise ye the Lord. Now, uh, one of the reasons I read all of that is that verse 15. Very fascinating verse, isn't it? Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of saints. And that's a verse that could cause you some confusion. Is, glad, is God glad when we die? Uh, but that verse should be interpreted according to its context. And the psalmist has just been delivered from death. Just say that and no more. And uh, we will get to that next time on Christmas Day, Lord willing. Father, help me to speak. Help each of us to hear your most precious word. Amen. Amen. What we have in this psalm is a public thanksgiving for a personal individual deliverance. We have a public thanksgiving for a personal individual deliverance. That's what this psalm's all about. And a contrast to this would be collective public thanksgiving for collective deliverance. You know, there's a time for a church to get together. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for our church. For a nation to get together, thank you, Lord, for what you've done for our nation, for a family. But this psalm is a public thanksgiving for a personal individual deliverance. 
which kind of makes me think that, wow, when we come to church and sing hymns, we're, we're joining a group of other people praising God, but uh, wouldn't there be some word of thanksgiving for something God's done for us that week or in our life? And not just have a collective public thanksgiving, but a, 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 a public thanksgiving for personal deliverance. That's where the vows come in in the end. You don't do this at home. You go to the temple and fulfill your vows publicly for something that God's done for you personally. It's obvious if you and I are in a group that's delivered, that you're also individually delivered. If you're in a group and you're delivered, then you've been delivered as well as the group. If you were in Noah's Ark, that was a collective deliverance of eight people. If you're one of those eight, that affects you personally, very, very personally. Uh, but you are in you 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 have a collective a deliverance. If you're in the Exodus, you're one of two million that enjoyed the Exodus. If you're in the exile, uh, however many Jews were exiled, and you were brought back to the land, and probably the Egyptian Hallel, it starts celebrating the Exodus, but most people believe all these were written after the exile. The exile was like a second Exodus almost. And so, um, obviously, if the city of Jerusalem is delivered like it was in Hezekiah's time, and you're in that city, that's a collective deliverance. But if you're, it's personal for you. And of course, Hezekiah had a personal deliverance. Some people thought he wrote this psalm. I don't think that. But, you know, because he had those extra 15 years. If you're one of the 144,000 in the tribulation, I don't believe you are. <laughs> my, th my eschatology is different than that. But uh, whoever those people are, if you're one of those and you are, you get the seal and you don't die and you survive the tribulation, you are personally delivered, but you're part of a group that's delivered. And there's a group deliverance, but there would be an individual deliverance, and the 144,000 are singing about their deliverance, collective uh, deliverance. I think I've gone down that road or not. But there's plenty of times we as a church have been blessed, right? God did this for us. God did that for us. And we can thank him for it collectively. And we know we benefit along with many other people. Or he blesses our fellowship. And yes, we, I'm part of the many who've been blessed. But this psalmist is not praying here, save my nation, save my family. He's praying about what God did for him and praising God for it. Not praising God for what he did for the Jewish nation or for his family, but specifically and personally for him. Kind of like Jonah, if I can illustrate it. What did Jonah, as he's quoting all those psalms in the belly of the fish, Jonah vows he's going to go to the temple, play his vow. This is what you did if you were delivered personally. The way to thank God was not just to thank him privately, thank you, Lord, but to thank him publicly for that in the way of paying your vows in the temple that you made while you were asking God to deliver you. And so this is a very I and me and God thing, like Psalm 23 in this regard. So if you, uh, if you reread Psalm 116, the psalmist is talking about himself. He's the one in danger. He's the one that just about died. And he's the one that God delivered. He personally was in danger of death. It wasn't a collective that was in danger of death. It was him personally. Some people say, well, what's this personal thing doing in here? This is the Egyptian Hillel. All the rest of them is a collective. It's a national deliverance from exile. Psalm 114, 15, 17, and 18 are all national. And here is a collective. And so some have a problem with that, that somehow the collective's got to be here or whatever. But we're going to try to deal with that a little bit. And each of us, I hope, could stand up and give a testimony of something God's done for you personally. 
I, over the years, there have been people stand up in church. We had a heart, car wreck. God delivered us. Thank the Lord. I had cancer. God delivered me. Thank the Lord. I had serious surgery. It was a life, all these life-threatening uh, things. Thank the Lord. And uh, that's a good thing. None of that is bad. That's legitimate. Certainly New Testament. Certainly New Testament. And uh, there's certainly equivalence of this as the Apostle Paul writes about personal deliverances in 2 Timothy 4, 16 to 18, 2 Timothy 3, 10 to 11, and 2 Corinthians 4, 8 to 11 and other places. I hope we are thankful enough that we tell other people about it. I had this problem, looked bad, I prayed, God answered. Sometimes we pray, God answers, and then thank you, Lord, privately, but we never tell anybody else about it. Why would we do that? Paul didn't do that. Thomas didn't do that. And it's, we're not bragging as if, oh, I got an inside track with God. We're just thanking God for answering our prayer. We brought him into it as we prayed. So it's a public thanksgiving for a personal individual deliverance. <coughs> So I think that's the way to do it, and so we'll help 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 me do it tonight. Remember, God call cares for us as individuals, not just part of a group. And I think that's why this is really in here. It's fitting that we give group thanksgivings for group blessings, but the group thanksgivings should never overwhelm, never overwhelm or obscure individual thanksgiving for individual deliverance. After all, we've all been saved one by one, right? Even if you were saved in a service where other people were saved, you were saved one by one. In the in the uh, funeral we had last Sunday, uh, the Baptist pastor, I, I kind of set up the gospel, and he preached the gospel, and he did what Baptists do. He wanted people to raise their hand if they wanted to be saved, which I don't do, but I'm. if people do it, I don't. I get concerned some might make a false profession, but moment, but uh, three people raised their hand. My count. And you know how Baptists do. I saw that hand. I saw that hand. And, uh, and so forth. But I hope there were three that came to know the Lord. But if they were saved at that service, each one was saved individually. And so it's important for us, if God works, to be thankful and to share our thanks. Every person in every group that's ever been can engage in group thanksgiving, but they also ought to have something to say about what God's done for them. I want to tell you what God's done for my soul. Now, different titles of Psalm 16 that different writers have given. One, thanksgiving for deliverance for death. That's pretty good. Two, Jehovah the deliverer from death. Three, gratitude for deliverance. Four, help of the helpless. Five. How can I repay him? Six, Thanksgiving song of one who had escaped from death. Uh, that's that's a pretty good list, and pretty everybody's hitting on the same cylinder there. Virgin wrote, personal love fostered by a personal experience of redemption is the theme of this song. Didn't Paul go there sometimes? He loved me and he gave himself for me. Right? Crucified. I'm, I am crucified for you. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of the Lord Jesus, by whom the world is crucified to me and I to the world. Paul went personal, and he wasn't afraid to share that. Many times he gave his personal testimony in ways of witness. Some people say, you're not witnessing by giving your testimony. Well, yes and no. It depends on how you give your testimony. You got to get to the gospel and not just that, you know, your own experience, and Paul did. But this uh, this psalm is intensely personal, intensely individual. Watch the words I, me, or my. They occur in every verse but two. Very close to Psalm 23, that one. So uh, I'll give you McLaren's outline. One to four mainly describe the psalmist's peril. Five to nine, his deliverance. 
10 to 14, he glances back to his alarm and then draws reasons for his, his vow of praises. And number four, he bases the same vow on the, of, on the remembrance of the Lord who's loosed his bond. Now, whenever we read something, I hope you do this. I study with, you know, one of those pens with four kinds of, uh, four red, green, uh, brown, and uh, the other one, I forget, blue. I, I study with them. And in my study Bibles, I'm marking stuff up. And I like to use the four because first time I read it, I start marking stuff and I see things that are parallel and I circle words or I draw a line. I'm not saying you have to do that. That's what I do. You could do that. I'm saying it because you want to go beyond reading and study. I found that the word Lord is here 16 times. That's important. Apple L O R D. It's a covenant name for God. And it, uh, it, it's, it's important just to note that this is a God specific, not a God generic psalm. Right? He knows who he's thanking. So 16 times the word Lord is used. The word death is used three times. In verse 3, in verse 8, and in verse 15. Now that's important. It connects things. He actually was close to death. Very, very close. And he knew it. He may not have been as close to death as Jonah was, but, you know, he was pretty close. And if God hadn't intervened, he'd be dead. The word call is in verse 2, in verse 4, in verse 13, in verse 17. So sometimes these repetition of words can give you a clue how to outline the psalm. Sometimes it's not. You just read this is a theme. The word vows are twice, verse 14 and 18. And so just observations. Other things that you can learn if you have Bible study tools and things, is that the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, divided Psalm 116 into two psalms. They cut it in half. One to nine was the is was one psalm, and ten to nineteen is the other. Now the material is the same; they just number it different. I don't think that was legitimate at cutting in half, but that's what they did. The, Vul the Vulgate does the same. And most do not. Most Bible scholars don't believe that was justified. And uh, what I'm just mentioning to you, if you ever read the Septuagint, you wait the Psalms off. We're off a chapter here. It's where it happened right here. Now Paul quotes from verse 10. That's pretty significant in 2 Corinthians 4:13. But we'll have to save that for next time. But any time a Psalm is quoted in the New Testament. Our ears ought to go up. All right, here's a special a psalm. I, this will help me understand something in the New Testament. And another question should be always be asked, what does it teach concerning Christ? Now, the ancient writers, they all believed it was all about Christ. They believed it was just straight out all about Jesus. And it relates completely to his person and death and triumph. Most of the early fathers were of that opinion. I don't think that's right, but I think it's just worthy of notice. Now, obviously, the Psalms are about Jesus just the way everything else is about Jesus in the Bible. But it's, and I suspect there's more about Jesus in this Psalm that I will uncover or grasp until he returns. But I believe this is about an Old Testament person, and his experience will be mirrored by Jesus. And our Lord was delivered from death, and his death was precious in God's sight. And we'll talk about that next time on Christmas Day. Arno Gabeline said, next to the 23rd Psalm, the 116th is most beloved by God's people. Here the believer's individual experience is beautifully told. Now, any believer, whether it's the psalmist or anybody who's been delivered from death, has some sense of Jesus's deliverance of death and the gratitude he has to the God, the Father, and what must have been like for him to sing this before he died. We'll get that maybe more on Christmas Day. 
fascinating to remind ourselves that this psalm was among those sung after the Passover meal and the Lord's Supper and before he was arrested in the garden. Uh, what went through his mind as he sang this song? Okay, this is Bill Hickson's outline. We'll look at the first half of the psalm. And in the very first verse, the first thing we see is a revelation of the psalmist's love for the Lord who heard his cry for mercy. He says, I love the Lord. Hope you can say that. Hope you're not embarrassed to say that. You might have to say with Peter, Lord, you know I love you. I love the Lord. And he said, I love the Lord because he's heard my voice and my supplications. We love him because he first loved us. And that's true about the cross of Calvary when our God died for us. And it's true when he answers our prayers. Who are we? Who are we that the holy God of heaven ever hear our prayers and give us any kind of positive answer? Just amazing to think about. And I hope each of us can say, I love the Lord. And I, I don't always get my prayers answered right away or the way I like, but there's been times where I've prayed for something and it mm -hmm. happened. And we know many times we pray for things and we don't get what we're asked for. But when we do, there's something very tender about it and precious about it. Do we love him back? <laughs> he loves us in answering our prayers. Do we love him back? What a sad thing for a, a husband to kiss his wife and never get kissed back. <laughs> Where it all goes one way, or he's, he he gives uh, he gives uh, special cards on an anniversary or a birthday and gets nothing back. He gives hugs but gets not a hug back. That's not the way we want our relationship to the Lord, or vice versa. The wife that does it and the husband doesn't. You know, what if what if if we love the Lord because He has loved us? His affection stirs up ours. His love stirs up ours. You know, a marriage counseling per, uh, principle is if your mate doesn't love you, what do you should you do? Just love on them more and see what happens. <laughs> it might work. I'm not saying it always will. Might. Why not? So this hymn is 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 a uh, 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 one on one between the psalmist and the Lord. One said, it's strikingly personal from beginning to end. The way Psalm 23 is, it's strikingly personal from beginning to end. And the very first thing the psalmist says, he tells us of his love for the Lord. Um, and the rest of the first part of this psalm, from verse 2 to 9, he's telling us reasons for his love. And he's describing his love. Of the Lord and how it came about and why it came about and everything else. All of us have a major responsibility in life to love God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our might. That's that's part of the commandments, right? We're commanded to do that. That's not optional. And each of us individually need to love the Lord. And all of us collectively need to love the Lord. And if we read this again, and I'm going to read these first nine because that's where we're going to be, I want you to hear this statement by another Bible teacher, Derek Kidner, one of my favorite writers on the psalm. There is an infectious delight and in touching gratitude about this psalm. Personal tribute of a man whose prayer has found an overwhelming answer. I'd be dead if you didn't answer me. And you answered me. So let's watch it. I love the Lord because he's heard my voice and my supplications. Because he's inclined his ear to me, therefore I'll call on him as long as I live. And then he, goes, then he starts describing it. The sorrows of death compass me. The pains of Sheol got hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. 
Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. And I was brought low and he helped me. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you've delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I'll walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Now, he is willing to love the Lord openly. And he's willing to call on the Lord publicly. That's what these first verses are about, one and two. I'm following Kidner there. So there's an open confession of God as a duty of faith and as the delight of his soul. He's doing what he knows he needs to do. I got a vow to fulfill publicly, but he's doing what he wants to do. I want to do this. I can't wait to do this. I'm looking forward to this. I was looking forward to my wedding vows. Were you? I wanted to do that publicly. I wanted to say that in front of everybody. He wants to give. He 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 wants to be public about the Lord and his love for the Lord. He's going to pay his vows, and he's not sad. He's doing it. Mark Futato is a man I always enjoy on the Psalms, and he said Psalm 116 is arguably the most personal of all Psalms of Thanksgiving. There seems to be a level of intimacy between the psalmist and God. It's unparalleled in other similar songs. This psalm really nails it. And he says, in this psalm, tender thoughts and feelings flow from the heart of the psalmist to the Lord in response to the Lord's goodness to the psalmist. And the first response, I love the Lord. And so that thanksgiving is still fresh from that deliverance that was still fresh. He just got out of a really bad situation where death was almost certain if God didn't intervene. Death was coming. He called on the Lord. The Lord delivered him, and he got out. And as a result, can I say it? He sees God differently. Is that? He sees God different. I didn't think I was going to get out of it. I thought I was a dead man. I could have been a dead man. And apart from the Lord, I would have been a dead man. And God, I prayed and God answered and I'm not dead. <laughs> and the interesting thing was he wasn't just thankful for being alive. He was thankful for experiencing God and knowing that every day he lived for the rest of his life was a day that God gave him that he got God had an act that he wouldn't have. And so we are supposed to love the Lord. Deuteronomy 6, 5, 7, 9, 10, 12, 13, 2, 30, verse 6. It's our role. Psalm 31, 23 says, Oh, love the Lord, all you saints. It's shocking that Jesus said in John 5, 42, I know you, you have not the love of God in you. And those were religious people, spent their life studying the Bible and going to the temple. We are those that love God. I hope you can say that. All things work together for good to those who what? Love God. It's called according to his purpose. All things don't work together for everybody everywhere. The Bible doesn't say that. That's a false promise. That's a false hope. All things work together for those who what? Love God and are called according to his purpose. It's a Christian. Now that I'm a Christian, I'm guaranteed that the worst things that happen to me are still going to bring about good somehow, some way. We love him because he first loved us. Not to love him is a fatal omission. 1 Corinthians 16, 22, if anybody loves not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. He's so wonderful, so good. He's exerted himself on our behalf in such a way that we, not to love him is just beyond awful. 
So in this psalm, first of all, there's a revelation of the psalmist's love for the Lord. That's verse 1. And the reason for that love. I love the Lord because he's heard my voice and my supplication. Revelation of the love of the Lord and the reasons for that love. Second, there's a resolution to call on him all his days. Uh, King James says, because he's inclined his ear on him, his ear to me, verse 2, therefore I'll call him as long as I live. It's literally all my days. Which means what? Every day. Every day, the rest of my life, all my days, because he's inclined his ear to me, therefore I'll call on him every day. All my days. Uh, Mike has just got back from Scotland on a business trip, and Linda and I were over there. And in, in, in Edinburgh there, they've got a statue to a little dog. You see it when you're on the tour. We drove by it. And close to that statue is a cemetery. And that dog's master died. And I've forgotten the dog's name. You can Google it and find it. From the time they buried that master to the time that dog died, that dog went and visited the master's grave and laid on it. Every day. He was so faithful in his affection for his master. Not a day passed. Where he didn't go to that graveyard. Years. And it was so obvious that they made a they made a statue. My memory was better. I would remember his name and that. But this is what he's saying. There's a revelation of the psalmist's love for the Lord and the reasons for that love. And then there's a resolution to call on him every day. Every day, without fail, I am in the business of calling on the Lord. I did it, and I got delivered from death. I'm not going to waste a day of my life never calling on the Lord. I'm going to call on him every day. Every day. That's a resolution. So the first, there's a revelation of the psalmist's love for the Lord, and then there's a resolution to call on him every one of his days, verse 2. And then... There's a recollection of the Lord saving him in answer to his call for help. He goes back in his mind to that time when he was delivered. When he was delivered. You know, you get delivered from death. You kind of remember those things. I, I've mentioned this before, but one time I think I counted up 14 times I was delivered from death as a young person. It's not hard for me to remember those days. I forget a lot of stuff. I remember. And and I know many times I was calling on the Lord. Sometimes I wasn't doing what I ought to be doing, and God was gracious anyway. And delivered me. It certainly got my attention. And so he's going to call on the Lord every one of his days, and his mind is going to recollect those time, that this particular time, this must have been something, this particular time God saved him in answer to his call for help. That's what verses 3 to 6 are. He's going back in his mind. He's reliving it. The sorrows of death compassed me. That didn't sound good. What's that mean? I'm a dead man. I'm a dead man. The sorrows of death compassed me. The pains of Sheol got all hold of me. They are the grave. In other words, this is hell. I'm in trouble here. I'm in, I'm in the grave or hell. I don't. I think Sheol means the place of the dead, but I'm, I'm a dead man. It's parallel thought with death. I found trouble and sorrow. That was his situation. This was his prayer. This was his reaction. Then called I on the name of the Lord. Oh, Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. That is the reflex action of a Christian. It's a reflex, reflex action of a Christian. I've told this story before, forgive me, but it's, it's an illustration to me that I never forgot. 
And when I'm thinking about the psalm, I, I start going back to times where I could have died and didn't. Um, seemed like I got in a lot of trouble in cars. <laughs> Once I was in a car, someone else was driving, and we almost got hit by a train. The other time we almost got, you know, we were in a Volkswagen and we almost got hit by a Cadillac broadside on my side. The other time I was driving, I was 19, and I was in a country road going somewhere to pick somebody up. It was about 10 o'clock at night and it was snowing. And they, the ice trucks had been out in this country place. Got off work late, beers and Roebuck and Shola Coffee at the branch, and I was picking someone up and I was. Two hours late. I'm driving and I'm two hours late to pick this person up. And I thought I'll make up time by speeding on the hills that are sanded. Typical 19 year old wisdom. So I'm really slow on the straight parts where it's not as icy. But as soon as I get on a hill, I'm gunning it. And that worked pretty good for a little while, but. Um, finally, I got to a hill where they'd run out of sand. My favorite car of my life, the 1961 Chevy Biscayne. wasn't a muscle car, it was a four-door, but it was close to a muscle car I ever got. And I'm in that thing. And I come over that hill, and I hit the ice, and that car starts doing this. And there's a river near the road. And it was at flood time. I shot up a quick prayer. I thought I was dead because I couldn't swim. I didn't learn to swim for another two years. I thought I was dead. And there's nobody there. There was no houses, nobody. It's like 25 degrees out. I'm in the middle of the country. It's dark, 10 o'clock, and I'm heading for the river. And I was hoping I would hit a tree with my wonderful biscuit. And I prayed, Lord, save me. I was a Christian, although I wasn't really walking with the Lord. And that car spun around, spun around. I missed the tree, and it came right to the edge of the river. I mean, sideways. I opened the door on the driver's side and looked down and there was no ground, just water. Both of my tires, front and back, were that this far from the edge. And there's snow all around. That's how close I came to dying at 19. I would never have got out of that car. And even, I, even if I did, I wouldn't know what to do in that kind of icy water in the middle of nowhere. It was stunning. God saved me. I didn't deserve to be saved. I wasn't living for the Lord. I was going to church on Sunday, but Friday and Saturday, he was somewhere else. He was merciful to me. You think I can forget that? I'll give you, I'll give you more, but I'm not. That's enough. The psalmist had an experience personally. And in his mind, in that experience, I'm dead. And I'm sure you could go back in your mind and have a similar story, and we could say, what was your time where you almost died? What was your time when you almost died? And you could give, you, if you start stopping back and think, you could give quite a few. Now, some of us are a little ornerier or stupider than others, and we got more, but any time is something, you know. So here is a... A, a recollection of the Lord saving him in answer to his call for help. That's what three to six is. And I was so scared that night when I opened that door. I was afraid to drive the car off. I thought it'll slip in the river and I'll be dead. And so I actually got out of the car and walked about a mile and knocked on a guy's door and he had big dogs and they were barking. Fortunately, he came to the door and 
said, my car's by the river. I need to call a wrecker. I'm afraid to drive it off. It. It'll be in the river. He was a race car driver. He put his coat on. Here's 1030 at night. I'm knocking on the guy's door. I wonder he didn't shoot me through the door. But he walked down with me and uh, drove the car. God provided. And my car wasn't even hurt. But my pride was. <laughs> yeah. What's that? Oh, I definitely drove slower after that. <laughs> you better believe it. <laughs> now, David was saved from death. And he says, the sorrows of death compassed me. The pains of Sheol got hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. It's one of those arrow prayers that Bob Lawton used to talk about from this pulpit. It, it, pretty fast, right? Lord, save me. Kind of like Peter when he was starting to sink in the waves. Oh, Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. He preserves the simple. I was brought low and he helped me. So he, he, he understands what happened and why it happened. This recollection of God saving him when he called for help. He was on the verge of death. And God was gracious and compassionate and righteous. And he delivered him from that death. And there's this marvelous collage of attributes in this one verse, one of my favorites in verse 5. Gracious is the Lord, righteous and merciful. Three attributes specifically. Uh, combined to deliver him. He didn't deserve it. God was gracious and merciful, and because of Jesus' death, he could be righteous in delivering him. So, God's grace is plentiful for every need in his righteousness. Someone said he gives just treatment and merciful care. You know what he's doing? He's celebrating the rectitude and moral excellencies of the God he loves. There's something about God that impresses him. He looks up at God as one who's all of these things and more. And no doubt he knew these things intellectually, but when he experienced them personally, it just sank so deep into his heart in a new way. And Martin Luther calls verse 5 the essential rectitude of God's nature. And he, he delighted in God's character and enjoyed it. And it was, he, there's a, a good will towards God, someone said, and a heartfelt gratitude. And, and it's, it, my God's a good God. He's gracious. He's merciful. He's righteous. So there's the revelation of the psalmist's love for God. There's a resolution to call on him every day. And there is a recollection of the Lord saving him in a specific situation in light of a specific prayer. And there's something about my God was involved in my life. My God did not let me die. Because I'm precious to him. And I'm not going to die. My life is precious to him. And I'm not going to die until it's my time to die. I got to die if I'm a human being. Unless the rapture happens. But before, it, 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 but God, is, my life is precious to him. it will help answer that. And we'll look at that next time. What does the hymn to say? In the hymn, Abide With Me. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless to abide with me. It's a humbling thing for me to know that God was in that car with me that night. Many other times, my life would have been gone. In that Volkswagen, I was sitting on the side, the Cadillac was coming in front. And I hollered to the guy that was driving, Volkswagen swerved. And you know those two pipes on the back of the Volkswagen? They went like this. I was in the back seat on that side. And that would have been me going, you know. So thank God for God's mercies upon mercies upon mercies in our life. So this recollection of God's involvement and acts on his behalf, and the, it, it, this recollection, and then there's a 
And fourthly, there's a recognition of God's goodness to him in saving him from death. He not only saved me, I don't, I don't just recollect it, I recognize his goodness in doing it. He didn't have to do it. He did it. And so in verse 7, notice what it says. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord's dealt bountifully with thee. Now, a recognition, it's an admonition to himself. Don't be worried like you've been worried. Don't be, don't be sweating everything. Don't be nervous about everything. Turn to your rest. The Lord's dealt bountifully with you. He loves you. He's with you. He's got this. He not only has this thing in the past, he's got whatever comes in the future. And there's this recognition, there's this uh, recognition that uh, he gives to the Lord. He brings up that personal admonition to himself in verse 7. And then there is this recognition that he brings up a personal uh, 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 appropriation from what has just happened. I got to act a little differently, live differently. I'm going to return to my rest. I'm not going to let this sweat me so much, bother me so much. Return to your rest, O my soul. And recognition brings about aspiration. Notice what he says: Return to my rest, O my soul, for the Lord's dealt bountifully for thee. For you've delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from falling. Walk before the Lord in the land of the living. You all this. You see, he wasn't just afraid to die physically. It was affecting him mentally. Whatever he was in mostly moved him to tears. He couldn't take it anymore. He was losing it emotionally. You ever lose it emotionally? You ever tell God, I can't take much more of this? So he says, you've delivered my soul from death and my eyes from tears and my feet from falling. He delivered him physically. That's from death. He delivered him emotionally. That's the tears. He delivered him spiritually, my feet from falling. That's a pretty good, because you know, when we're emotionally worn out and we're, we're physically in danger, we can become in, uh, we can become spiritually in danger, right? You can say, oh, it's, I got all this. Get mad at God and all that. So all of this brings about this aspiration. Uh, so there's this, he brings up an admonition to himself, verse 7. He brings up uh, appreciation, uh, personal an admonition, personal admonition, verse 7, personal appreciation in verse 8. And then there is the uh, personal aspiration in verse 9, a walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I think he got a lot of good out of that trouble, don't you? I think that his life was better because of that near-death experience. I think he was better from that situation, and this psalm was birthed by that. But he utilized it. He didn't just say, well, thank you, Lord, now I'm going to go do something else. He, he, his life changed. His day-to-day -day life changed. He got engaged in prayer. He got engaged. He got excited, enthused about the Lord and the goodness of the Lord. and. That was a life-changing experience. Who knows what you're going through right now, and you and everybody's going through something. I don't know anybody that's not always going through something, and sometimes they're, it's pretty hard stuff. Is this going to kill me? Or something like that. Or maybe just kill me financially because of the stock market. It is going up a little. <laughs> but it can probably go down again. But, you know, it can kill me emotionally. It can kill me whatever... Uh, uh, it, 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 in, in many ways, different things that we seek the Lord for. But a wonderful psalm and a wonderful beginning to this psalm. But the best is yet to come. Saving the best for Christmas in our communion service. So I hope you will come if you're free on Christmas evening, if you're able, because I won't be... Uh, we will have a business meeting the 18th, and uh, so we won't be able to do that. And Bob, uh, Dave West is preaching the 11th uh, in the evening, so it won't be till Christmas Day we'll be able to get back um, 
116. So I hope you'll be here for that if you're able, and if not, pray for us. But if you'd open your hymn book, uh, the Republican book, the 116B, you know I'm teasing. 116B, Michael, come and read us. Lord, as we go from this place, loving you more, trusting you more, may the power of your love and the light of your word shine forth to a sin darkened world as we go from this. 